This is our November service. Another year is working its way towards its conclusion. And we are inclined at this time to think fruitfully, I hope, about the seasons. Not only the seasons of life outside itself, outside ourselves, but also the seasons of life within ourselves. It's also, and as I hear the rain on the church today, I think it's also an incredibly rich and auspicious time for us to think about, pray about, and renew our love for our physical universe, the earth of earth, sky, and sea. For as long as we are in our physical bodies, we are one with that universe. It resounds in us and we resound with it. And when we pause, and we should pause, we should pause often and often and often again to think and look and wonder and cherish and then and only then we will see how clearly and how closely the world of space and matter echo in us and us in it. Our human nature is part of nature. Nature is in us and we are in nature. So the state of the physical world, its glories, its beauty, its diversity, reflects who we also are. And maybe more soberly, the woundedness of our world, its areas of barrenness, its areas of degradation, starkly reflect the state also of the spiritual health of our human family. In Seeking the Sacred, I emphasized that we need to love this world far more and far less conditionally in order that we would keep it safe and ourselves safe along with it. One of the greatest, most terrifying delusions of our time is that we can save ourselves without saving our physical world, without giving it in every way the benefit of the doubt and the benefit of whatever wisdom we have managed to accumulate. We cannot protect the earth without protecting ourselves and we cannot protect ourselves without protecting the earth. It almost breaks my heart to say this because it is so obvious. It is so obvious that it sinks almost towards foolishness. And yet this is not the hymn that the people of our world are singing. The words we use about nature are often words that we use about ourselves. When I was thinking about this, I, I found these words, that we feel dry sometimes, dusty, or flooded, sometimes flooded with emotion, or flooded with need. Many of us would admit to feeling drained, parched, depleted, in deep need of replenishment. Many of us are in an uproar or in a turmoil, Many of us believe we are not flowing in life stream. Many of us feel that we have been cut down in some way before our time or out of time. Many of us feel vulnerable to inward storms, to whirlwinds, to excessive heat, or to terrifying cold. On the other hand, we might also, in other moments, say how smoothly 
life is flowing. How restored we feel, or even that life is in this moment blossoming. Rumi, in our service today, already has reminded us that every tree, every growing thing as it grows, affirms one truth, that you harvest what you sow. With life as fleeting as a half-drawn breath, you have no need to plant anything but love. All that you see has its roots in the unseen. And this is more true of us than it is of any other species. Everything that we are emerges from the unseen. Everything that we are tells us something about the state of the world soul as well as our individual souls. But Rumi also reminds us that every sight will vanish and every word will fade but be strong of heart, because where they come from is everlasting and renewing. And it's that word, renewing, that is so much part of our spiritual life here together. We are, each time we turn our minds inward, each time we remember who we are, when we remember who the other is, we are renewing. So perhaps one of the greatest lessons that we can take from this magnificent world of ours is the gift of regeneration. Winter is behind us in our part of the world. But winter is also a time when so much is happening. This is true in our own dark times. So much is waiting, always, to be born. Change takes place whether we see it or whether we are trusting it. Spring could not be spring without the growth that precedes it. Understanding nature, understanding our own human nature, we can only grow in respect for it in all the ways that it manifests pleasing and less pleasing. We do this best by observing, by pausing, by learning constantly, by knowing ourselves to be learners, to be seekers, to be possessed of that beautiful state of mind that we call the beginner's mind, that allows us the innocence to see each spring as though we have never seen the spring before, and to trust each winter as though we have never trusted a winter before. Our human family, our human family, our human family to which we belong has a very shaky history when it comes to trying to control what we call nature. And the idea that we have dominion over nature rather than being part of it, has had and continues to have tragic consequences. We have a capacity to harm. We have a capacity that is at least as great. In fact, as a spiritual optimist, I have to say even greater, we have a capacity to heal. And it is our job to do what we can to heal our world and to heal ourselves as we move through this world, to be part of the world's healing and to be as little engaged as possible in the world's harm. This is a time of rapidly changing consciousness, exhilarating changes of consciousness. This is a moment of change and we are part of it. And even if our voices are fewer, they are our voices and let us hear them. Let us affirm one another in our passion for caring for this world. 
It is from that stance, spirit learning from nature and nature teaching us about spirit, it is from that stance that we come to understand the unity between all the forms of life and this constant dance between the seen and the unseen. The literally unseen in winter, as winter then gives itself into spring, and also the spiritual unseen, the world of the unseen, that it, it that is also so immensely powerful, so indescribably powerful, when we tune our minds and hearts and spirits and souls to its exhilarating melodies. The earth, the earth, is literally our common ground. It is what we hold in common. It is what in common holds us. And for those of us who are trying to find ways to think about spirituality in ways that are healing and unitive rather than divisive, this truth has a very particular poignancy that we can learn from the earth, that we do not harm one part of it without harming all of it, that we do not heal a part of it without healing in some way all of it. We humans are not the only species on this earth, but we are the only species with the gifts of consciousness and of choice. A great deal of the earth's fate is in our hands, is relying on our wisdom, is relying on our love, our care, our hope, our energy, our willingness to affirm yes, this matters, but first we must see. We must see. We must look deeply. We must look past our prejudices. We must look past the pettiness of some of our immediate concerns to allow ourselves to see the bigger picture. We must also learn by looking deeply into nature itself. Is anything, I would ask you, more beautiful or more persuasive than the sound of clear rushing water? Is anything more piercing in its beauty than looking deeply into the heart of a flower? Perhaps a flower that bursts into flower for a day only. Is anything more awesome than the feeling you have when you stand on the earth on a clear night and look up into the sky and know that you are part of a wondrous universe? Is anything more terrifying than a storm that shows no sign of abating? Our physical world is full of teachings. Not a day could go by in which the earth does not offer itself to you, not only as mother, but as teacher. We are the earth's children. We are the earth's students. We learn again too from that about the seasons in our own lives, sometimes seasons within a single day. We learn that, like nature itself, whatever is arising will pass. The marvellous moments will pass. The terrifying moments will pass. Frost, snow, heat, drought. The mildest day, the longest night, all pass. Winter gives way to spring and spring gives way to summer. And summer yields to autumn. And as I have often said, and as I wrote in my book, Forgiveness and Other Acts of Love, often 
and most unaccountably, the seasons of sorrow are followed by seasons of joy. And help often comes wearing strange disguises. I'm going to leave you with a particularly gorgeous reading. It's a very old one. And it's a very beautiful one. It's from Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew Bible. To everything, there is a season. And a time to every purpose under heaven. There is a time to be born. There is a time to die. There is a time to plant and there is a time to harvest. There is a time for ignorance, and there is a time to heal. There is a time to break down, and there is a time to build up. There is a time to weep, and there is a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn, and there is a time to dance. There is a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together. There is a time to embrace, and there is a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time to seek, and a time to lose. There is a time to keep, and a time to cast away. There is a time to take apart, and a time to sow. There is a time to keep silent, and to keep silence. And there is a time to speak. There is a time to love. And there is a time to rediscover love. There is a time of unrest. And yes, and yes again, there is a time for peace. Blessed be.